happens or they do not happen, right? Right. That's so right. are we on? Okay, go ahead and press live. We're good. <laughs> Got some delays going on. You hear me? The echo, the echo. We're on? Okay, so welcome, family. Thank you for coming and celebrating with us 10 years of the Empower Series. So I want to thank everybody who's viewing online. So people in Dallas and Houston in the United States and around the world, welcome to the Empower Series. And show some love, everybody. Show some love. <laughs> So we are full now. We have some good breakfast. We have some good conversation, good connections. I um, wish you were here, but you were here you're here with us now virtually. And I'm not going to spend too much time because I know I'm between you and our keynote speaker right now. Uh, but I do want to express some appreciation to everyone for taking a portion of your life mm -hmm. and spending it here with us. Uh, last night we had some great conversations over dinner, and we, we realized that time is very precious. Our most precious resource are the time that we have. We don't know how much we have, and once we spend it, we can't get it back. So the fact that you're spending time with us online watching or here breaking bread with us is very precious to me. I want to make sure that you're getting real value, and the dividends from this far outweighs what you can ever imagine. So again, thank you for, for joining. We started the Empower Series in 2011. The, I actually, the idea came in 2010. Um, Will Murphy giving you some dap, man, you were the one that, like, you, you, you have an idea, you share it with somebody, you just hope they don't just shut it down. So Will Murphy was really the first beta speaker in 2010 uh, with this idea of the Empower Series and doing events to really empower the community. We started in 2011 with Dr. Dennis Kimbrough at SMU, and it really was not just me. It was really a, a collective of a number of people and organizations because, as Dr. George Frazier says, nothing of significance can ever be done alone. And so we started with the uh, National Association of Black Accountants, the National Black MBA Association, uh, 100 Black Men of Greater uh, Dallas-Fort Worth, the National Sales Network, uh, the Urban Financial Service Coalition, and a lot of individuals, a lot of volunteers that put together the Empower Series. We started this on the third Saturday of every month. We were somewhere in the community at a college campus, a church, at a, a library just pouring into the community and we've been doing that for over 10 years so a lot to be said a lot of lives have been touched and actually the empower series became a nonprofit organization in 2015 so we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization if you want to find out more about what we do check us out on our website www.empowerseries.com subscribe to our youtube channel connect with us on social media and in 2015 like i said we became a nonprofit and we received our first grant from Comerica Bank in 2017. Um, at that time, uh, I opened the, the bank account in uh, downtown Dallas at the Comerica Tower. And at that time, uh, a young gentleman by the name of <laughs> Brandon Jones was, was helping the brother out, <laughs> opened up <laughs> an account. But now he's the VP of External Affairs Market Manager here in Texas. He has a move on up, right? So right now, what I want to do is just give him an opportunity to, to welcome us today before we introduce our keynote speaker. So Brandon, please come up and introduce yourself. So thank you so much, uh, Clifton. Look, everybody give Clifton a hand. He is amazing. Um, he has just become a part of the fabric of how we serve community at Comerica. We really believe in raising expectations um, in our communities through serving, right? And he is just a co wonderful connection to community. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for Empower Series. Thank you for bringing these wonderful speakers. And, and you can just see, if you've gone to the Empower Series, you can see how these speakers have really touched the lives of the individuals that attend these, 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 these programs. And so we're just so proud of how you've grown. Yes, I was there at that desk. <laughs> And Clifton walked up and he had a sponsorship check and he was like, y'all the first bank to sponsor me, so I'm going to open an account. <laughs> and I was like. <laughs> <laughs> and Irv came down, my boss, and I'm sending greetings from Irv and Ashford. He's our chief community officer for the bank. He is um, in Detroit right now. But he came and Irv said, hey, I need you to take care of this brother right here because he's good people. And he's going to be one of, <laughs> our, one of our premier uh, community partners. And you have been a standout community partner. So thank you all for what you've done. We'll be happy to sponsor you today, tomorrow, and in the future. Wow. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Brandon. I'll tell you that one of the things that Comerica does is they focus on relationships. 
And it, you know, an organization is not just an, uh, uh, a non-human entity. It's made of a, a group of people who've come together with a common vision and purpose. So as Comerica focuses on relationships, they really are about helping people and, indi and businesses be successful mm -hmm. and helping us raise not only the expectation of what a bank can be, but also what we can be. Uh, so with that being said, every interaction I've had with everybody at Comerica Bank has been relationship first. And I, I'm sure Dr. George Frazier will talk to you about life is about building relationships, right? So I'll, I'll let him talk more about that. And, and what's interesting about this, to, to kind of get out of the way, I do want to share something with you. I met the Dr. George, I became aware of Dr. George Frazier in 2013. Dr. Dennis Kimbrough uh, released a book called The Wealth Choice. And in 2013, he was going through Dallas on a book tour, and that was the same time that uh, Dr. George Frazier was running the Frazier Net in Addison, Texas. And so he was there selling his books for a while. And, and at that time, I met not only Dr. George Frazier, um, but I also met Michael Roberts. And through the years, I've met a number of, of I, I didn't know at that time, but future Empower Series speakers. So Wendy, Wendy Ida, Michael Collier, Dr. Dr. Uh, Randall Pinkett, mm -hmm. um, like I said, Michael Roberts has spoke, uh, Suzanne, Suzanne Hart. And so all of these people I've, ha I've met through that connection. So you really don't think, you, you don't know what's gonna happen in the future. You really don't know. You see these, these events that are happening and they don't seem to connect. But I would tell you it's really odd that I was born in 1961 and uh, Dr. George Frazier was born in 1945. So he was born on the East Coast, I was born on the West Coast. And who would have thunk it, right? right? <laughs> that at some point we would connect right. and our connection and our clicking at the right chemistry, the right timing, um, the, the, that it, everything would come together to where our collaboration would be, really be a blessing for multiple lives. Exactly. It, it's just amazing. So, so wherever you are, the connections that you're making here, you don't know the future but make that connection and always look at how can you add value. So with that being said, you know, Dr. George Frazier is, is not about his past because we don't have enough time to talk about all the things that he's done, but he is the chairman and CEO of FrazierNet, which is a company that he founded over 32 years ago. It's, uh, he wanted to lead a global networking and economic development movement for people of African descent. Uh, so he'll talk to you about where he was born, but he has spent the past 20 years at, in executive leadership for a number of corporate 500, uh, Fortune 500 companies. He is a best-selling um, author of over s of six books. He has received numerous awards and citations that I, I'm not going to spend the time listing for you because what's more important is what he's about doing today, and he'll talk to you more about that. Uh, two things, two recognitions that he has received. He has been named one of the best speakers in America and five of his speeches have been selected for global distribution by the prestigious Vital Speeches of the Day magazine, a first for any professional speaker in America. That is something to be said. In mm. 2016, President Barack Obama awarded Dr. Frazier the Presidential Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, <laughs> yeah, give it up. So here's his focus. He is focused on lifting up disenfranchised groups and people of color. He is most proud of two charter schools that he helped fund, found, uh, start in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, 15 years ago, of which he's educated over 300 in inner city mm -hmm. children from black families, of which 60% are boys. He resides in Cleveland, Ohio, and is married to the wonderful and beautiful Nora Jean Frazier for 47 years. <laughs> he has two children and he has lived a full life, 75 years plus some more. Mm -hmm. But what we're gonna do, we're gonna see now that 75 years and 120 seconds. And then I'm gonna bring them up. So let's play the video. And after the video, I'll introduce you to, I'll present Dr. George Frazier.
share our love, family. <laughs> Dr. George Frazier. I love you, man. Thank you, man. Thank you, man. Love you. Thank you. Wow. You know, I, I've seen that a thousand times, right? And when I look at it, I have an out-of-body experience. I, I can't believe I've lived that life. At going on 77, I just want to say to you that you're going to die. Don't waste your time. You will always know how much money you have, but you will never know how much time you have. Max it out. Live it with gusto. Do good, and good will come to you. I had not planned to say that, but uh, I was uh, sort of inspired by my own video for some strange reason. Well, let me start how I officially start. May God grant me the words to speak your thoughts. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for taking time, as Clifton said, for, out of your busy life to be here. Thank you to our live stream audience out there uh, in Facebook land. Technology is, is a monster. So we can have this, call, uh, this, this meeting in a small, intimate group here in this magnificent The Network Club in Dallas, Texas, like something I've never seen any place in the world and at the same time reach across the globe and share this very, very important information. Uh, Clifton, I cannot say enough about you. Um, you are a servant leader. You are selfless. You are brilliant. And brilliance comes in all shapes and sizes. And you are about our people. You, like me, are a race man. And a race man or a race woman is someone that has invested and committed to invest his time, talent, or treasure into the upliftment of his or her own people first. I love you for that. Thank you for making sure that this happened, and it has happened for 10 years in a row. 10, I mean, who does that, right? 10 years in a row. So let me get started with the meat of my discussion. Um, I want to say the next thing and still be loved, but, but you know, if you've seen me speak, you know that I am about truth. And the truth is like a lion. You don't have to defend it. All you have to do is let it loose and it will defend itself. So we're now going to talk for a moment about truth and our roles and responsibility as people of color to this world and to each other. Let me say that differently. We are all drinking from wells that we did not dig. That we are standing on the shoulders of giants who fought a 350 year fight from 1619 to 1864 for our freedom. A 250 year fight. A 100-year fight for civil rights, voting rights, and public access from 1864 to 1964. And the last generation to be able to take credit for that fight is the boomer generation. The youngest boomer is about 55. We are standing on the shoulders of giants, and we must never, ever, ever forget that. So the question then becomes, are we worthy of that legacy? Are we worthy of that legacy? A 250-year fight for freedom, a 100-year fight for civil rights, voting rights, and public access, are we worthy of that legacy? And if, in fact, you feel that we are, 
and I hope that you do, the deeper question is, what then will be our legacy? Or the legacy of generation X, Y, Z, and generation Alpha. What will our children's 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 children be saying about them 150 years from now? I hope that legacy is deeply understanding the power and importance of building the relationships in our lives that we need and closing the income and wealth gap between us and them. That's what I hope future generations' legacies will be. And we are laying the foundation, laying out the system and the strategies to pass the baton to succeeding generations to take it to the next level. That's what we're doing. My favorite quote, because I'm OG, I'm old school, I actually met and grew up listening to Stokely Carmichael. Born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, Bed-Stuy. They say if you're from Bed-Stuy, you're either a thug or a gangster. I'm a gangster. <laughs> you're going to find that out in a few minutes. Okay? But it was Stokely Carmichael who so inspired me when I was a kid. Because I was one of those kids on the corners watching Malcolm talk on a soapbox in Harlem and Stokely Carmichael, who admired Malcolm. Both of them were very young. But it was something that resonated deeply with me. He planted a seed in me that has been with me all 76 six years of my life. And I'm going to quote it precisely from him. This is Stokely Carmichael in 1961. No black person in this country makes any advancement solely based on his or her talent or worth. All individual advancement is based on mass struggle. We make no progress in this world without shedding our blood. Therefore, your advancement and success does not belong to you. It belongs to the people. And if you do not use your success or advancement for the benefit of your people, it is a betrayal of the people who shed their blood for you. Now that, that's a mic drop moment. You, you need to be applauding on that. I mean, that is, that, that is, that is exactly right. When I started FraserNet Inc. nearly 40 years ago, our promise was simply under our logo, connect, grow, and prosper. That's what it said. Those were the three words. That was our promise. So that you could learn, earn, and return. We have a lot of us learning and a lot of us earning, but not enough of us returning. So we're going to talk about the strategies and tactics necessary for us to return. We're going to talk about networking, building effective relationships. And then I'm going to touch on for a moment Networking 2.0, advanced networking. I'm going to talk about some basics. Actually, the title of my talk this morning is The Seven Biggest Mistakes We Make When Networking That Will Ruin Your Reputation and Destroy Your Business. Why is networking important for business? Most of us are in business. Either we have our own business or we're working in a public, private, or independent sector business. But we are, in fact, in business. Business is about relationships. Without relationships, you have no business. Without relationships, you have no business being in business. In fact, the business you're really in is the business of building relationships. Let me say that differently. You don't build a business. 
you build your people and your people build the business. The customer is not the most important. Your people, your employees, the people that work for you, they are the most important because if they're not taking care of your customers, you won't have any customers. They are first. Why is networking important for your business? You get a chance to meet and to connect with potential clients. They're everywhere. You just don't know until you unpack and bond that relationship. Why is networking so important for business? It's a chance to get outside of your business and open yourself up to new ideas. You don't have the, all the good ideas. You don't have the original ideas. I talked about an idea last night at dinner. Profound concept. And one of my dinner mates synthesized that idea and made it better. Now I'm going to steal it from him. <laughs> I'm going to use it. It's called the FICA effect. It helps you to understand that there's only a 20% chance that your marriage will last to fulfill your vows till death do us part, that's a hell of a vow. I've been married to the same sister for nearly 50 years. And people ask me all the time, Dr. Fraser, what's the secret to staying married to the same sister for nearly 50 years? Amnesia. <laughs> you want a one-word answer, right? Nora Jean is going to do some dumb shit in her life. Dr. Fraser is going to do some dumb shit in 50 years, right? You discuss your dumb shit. You reach middle, middle ground on that dumb shit. And then you bless it and release it, never to bring that shit up again. Right? We don't have time to unpack the five things that can go right or wrong in a marriage to sustain it. But if there's some time left over, if there's a question you want me to, to, to do it, I'll do it. Why is networking important for business? It builds your confidence and it gives you exposure. You got to do it. If you want to be in business. In fact, if you want to build any damn thing in life, you've got to build relationships. Now, this is biblical. Dr. Fraser didn't make this up. It is actually a direct quote from Jesus Christ. John 5.30. There are 800,000 words in the Bible. Only 1,200 words are direct quotes from Jesus Christ. John 5.30. And Jesus said, I of my own self can do nothing. Now this was Jesus the Son of God, and he couldn't get it done on his own, by himself, in a vacuum. So what's up with you? Why would you think you could do anything worth talking about on your own, by yourself, in a vacuum? He had to have 12 disciples, and we know that one of them turned on him. You must understand this. You must practice it. You must learn about it. You must teach your children the power and importance of relationships and how to build those relationships and sustain those relationships over time. Finally, why is networking important for business? You gain support and knowledge from people who are further along in business or their profession than you are. And that's what you want. So I'm going to put a pin in that one, and I'm going to unpack that as I unpack what I think are the seven biggest mistakes we make when networking. I'm talking about black folk. Now, why do I distinguish between blacks and whites? Because in 2000, I commissioned the Gallup organization to do a national study 
on the networking differences between black folk and white folk. The study cost $30,000. It was extraordinarily revealing. Now, of course, being the guy who have written one of the best-selling books ever written on networking, Success Runs in Our Race, The Complete Guide to Effective Networking in the African-American Community, a book I wrote 30 years ago, that we were eminently qualified to do the study ourselves. But I've been black a long time. And what did I know? That, white, that black folks would believe white folks before they believed black folks. So I had white folks do the study. I'll unpack some of the main ideas, the main thoughts that came out of that study in the context of my talk. To be a leader, and I consider all of you, everybody here, as a leader. To be a leader is to understand that you must transcend being good at just functional and analytical or problem-solving tasks. You must be able to build relationships that enable you to create a fabric of personal contacts that will provide you support, feedback, insight, resources, and information. That's called networking, brothers and sisters. Leaders understand that the alternative to effective networking is to fail, that you simply will not reach a leadership position or you will not succeed at leadership without effective networking skills. Leaders are great networkers and can work effectively with a diverse array of people. We must all become leaders. Now, I just read that quote out of the book, Click, 10 Truths for Building Extraordinary Relationships. Now, you are the average of the five people that you spend the most time with. The fastest way to change yourself is to hang out with people who are already where you want to be. What am I saying to you? Don't spend major time with minor people. People going nowhere want you to go nowhere with them. People doing nothing want you to do nothing with them. If you want to change your life, change your relationships. It's no more complicated than that. What is the secret of life, Dr. Fraser? Do what you love with people that you love. Let me say that again. So you need to write that one down. Right? right? Do what you love with people that you love. You cannot fail. If you are not where you want to be, it's because you don't have the right people in your life. No more complicated than that. Let me say that a different way. The most powerful asset that you will have in the 21st century will not be your computer. I'm sorry. I don't care what you've heard. It will be your relationships. Always has been and always will be. So understand how this works. The study by the Gallup organization revealed some huge errors that we are making. Remember, it was a com culturally comparative study. What they do habitually and what we do or do not do habitually. There are seven big mistakes. I'm going to start with number seven and lead up to number one. You probably can't guess what number one is, but it's I've been around a long, long time, and here's what I've learned about our people. 99.999% of everyone I've 
ever given a business card to, or, or they requested it, has never, ever, ever followed up. And they got a business card from America's networking guru. I ain't bragging, I'm just saying. <laughs> and they didn't follow up. What's up with that? Now, there are a lot of reasons why people don't follow up. Sometimes they lose the business card. Sometimes they're a bit intimidated. Sometimes they just ask for a business card just to say, I have this important person's business card. So there are lots of reasons why people don't follow up. But the fortune is in the follow-up. Don't make that mistake. Follow up. There is no day or there is no card that I don't follow up on within 24 hours. There is no call or text message or email that I receive in a day that it, the call or the text or the email is not returned, generally speaking, before I go to bed. That's my goal at night, is I go through my text, emails, and whatever deserves a response right then and there, I do it. I don't make it long, I keep it short, if it's something I can't answer short, I'll, say, I'll give you a call tomorrow. It might be too late to call them then. Follow up. Texts, emails, certainly business cards, phone calls within 24 hours. Now, if you've called me, you know that I answer my own phone in spite of the fact that I have three executive assistants. But I answer my own phone. And you notice that most of the time, as Clifton, I give you my cell phone. So you don't have to go through the bureaucracy and the red tape to get to me. Because I want to touch you. I want to hear your voice. I want you to hear my voice. There's something powerful about that. I learned that trick, really, um, that strategy from one of the first major black executives in America, um, uh, Baron... La, what is oh what is Mr. Barron's last uh, first name? Oh, the Baron Taylor. La Baron Taylor was the senior vice president of Sony back in the seventies. He was an HNIC. Make no mistake about it. Very very powerful, and he was a big deal at the Congressional Black Caucus because he put on the biggest, baddest, boldest parties where everybody wanted to get an invitation. You had to get an invitation to LeBaron's party. I wanted an invitation. I had spoken at the caucus uh, for 40 years, and I wanted an invitation to LeBaron's party, so I called him. I thought I would get one of his many secretaries at Sony. Nope, LeBaron answered the phone. And I was taken aback. And he asked me politely, how can he help me? And I told him, and he said, you know, absolutely. And he got me an invitation. But then it was a written invitation. He could have emailed it, but it was an email at that time. So return your calls. Do them in a timely way. Be as gracious as you can. You can't help everybody, and you can't say yes to every damn thing. In fact, that's one of the major failures of very successful people is that they don't know when to say no. But you can at least be polite and do it. So follow up within 24, no more than 48 hours. When I asked LeBaron for the invitation, the very next day, he FedExed it to me. That's how he rolled. Mistake number seven. Mistake number six. You make a poor first impression. First impressions are extremely important. And it begins with your introduction. How you introduce yourself. People are not interested in your life story. 
When people are out networking, there's lots of people they want to talk. What they want is enough information about you to pique their interest so that they will want to know more about you later, not your whole damn life story now. <laughs> so when meeting people, you need to craft a little elevator pitch. There are five elements of a good elevator pitch. Who you are, where you're from, and what you do. Those are the first three. The last two are the most important. How do you add real value? And if you add real value, quantify it and prove it to me. All of that in 17 seconds. Who you are, where you're from, what you do, how do you add real value, and then quantify it and prove it to me. Why is how do you add real value important? Because it's congruent with the purpose of life. And the purpose of life is not complicated because God doesn't make anything complicated. We make things complicated. We make things complicated so that we don't have to do them. The more complicated we can make something, the more reasons we have for not doing it. We make compl things complicated to control power. The more I understand, the less you understand, the more power I have over you. Now, where did we see this executed flawlessly? 2007 with credit default swaps. Who the hell understood what a credit default swap that brought down America and the global economy? So, keep it simple. Here's my self-introduction that I use on specific occasions. Hi, I'm Dr. George Fraser from Cleveland, Ohio, by way of Brooklyn, New York. I'm the CEO and founder of FraserNet Incorporated. I write books and speak on building effective relationships, and economic development and wealth creation. I help people turn acquaintances into friends and contacts into contracts. And over the last 40 years, I've helped more than 5,000 people secure $1.5 billion in new business. Good to meet you. That's 71 words. That's my life story in 71 words in 18 seconds. Now, I don't generally offer my business card. If people find me interesting enough or, in fact, would like to contact me, they request my business card. Because I believe, as you should believe, that my business card is a gift. Your card is a gift. Your card, when you give it to me, says, contact me. I have information, I have resources, I have thoughts and ideas that may be of value to you. But it's on you. It's my gift to you. But no, I do not run around a conference giving out business cards to people. You've seen that before. That's a waste of time. Actually, it's embarrassing. Don't do it. Your card should be requested. As you request cards from others, because you see giftedness and value in potentially in that relationship. That's a very high compliment to the person you're requesting the card from. Work on your self-introduction. Work on your facial expressions. So here's what I want you to do. I didn't mean to embarrass you. But when you, get, when you get up in the morning, I want you to go and look in the mirror, and I want you to look at your facial expression in its most natural and organic, where you're not messing with any of the 50 little muscles in your face. It's just you. I want you to look at your face when you're really comfortable and natural organic. Let me, let me show you what my face 
looks like when I'm not manipulating the, the small muscles in my face. This is my face when I look at it in the most natural, organic way. That's inviting. Yeah, you'd want to come over to me and shake my hand. You see, this is what happens when you're out networking and you're just in a natural and organic environment and you're not aware of your comportment and how you are conducting yourself. You're just being natural. And there are lots of people who are not approached by other people because they're in their most natural, organic state and it's threatening, uh, it's ugly, uh, it's not inviting, it's not welcoming. So you need to think about that. And you need to practice your public look. Really. Right? And be on guard with that look. And it's really, this is, this is what acting is all about. This is what actors do. And the best ones have wonderful ways of making subtle movements in their eyes and chin, right? For, to, to, to emote a certain expression. You've got to practice the same, same thing. A public face. There's a private face and there's a public face. So work on that. Your facial expressions are important. The third part of a poor impression is you come to a networking event or you come to an event to network and you ain't got no cards. And someone is highly impressed by your presence, your charisma, that beautiful smile that you have, that brain that you have articulated with brilliance, and they will request a card, but you don't have one. Now, this has happened in many times in my travels. In fact, people were so excited of wanting to give me their card because I requested it, they didn't have one. I have gotten, li literally, truth, business card information on toilet paper. People ran to the bathroom, wrote this stuff on a piece of toilet paper and gave it to me. So I did with that piece of toilet paper what you do with toilet paper. Right? So bring cards. <laughs> so I have my cards in my left pocket and the cards that I receive from other people is in my right pocket. Now, you can understand the reason for that, right? And that is so that if someone requests a card, I don't give them your card when I reach into my pocket. That has happened many times. I've gotten cards from brothers that had cell phone numbers with ladies' names on the back of their card. <laughs> so I did what any smart brother would do. I called the cell phone. <laughs> Pretended I was them. <laughs> you, know, you know, just see what would happen. But anyway, bring business cards. It's important. And have an emergency stack. Now, I had an emergency stack because I didn't have my jacket on last night at dinner. So I keep an emergency stack in my wallet, right? And that stack, generally, I have two or three extra cards, which I gave out last night at dinner, right, in my wallet. This, I, this is just for emergency. So you should have an emergency two or three cards stashed somewhere just in case, okay? Now, so that's the sixth biggest mistake, right? A poor first impression. The fifth biggest mistake is that you don't spend enough time networking. And this is one of the great reveals in the Gallup study that African Americans, on, in general, this was back in 2000 when we did it, spent less than 20% of their time working on cultivating and developing relationships at work, at home, and in the community. And white folks spent 41% of their time. As a result, white folks had 175 well-developed contacts and relationships that they could call on in life, and we had less than 30. This is huge. You need to be working on three 
types of networks through every phase and facet of your life. First is your personal network. These are the people that cheer you on, lift you up, love, love you. Let's call this your network at home. If things are not right at home, it's going to have a domino effect in the rest of your life. That's a personal network. And you need to work on these networks through every passage of your life. And each passage, you get about eight passages if you're lucky, each passage is about ten years. Let me say that differently. You're a different person at 10 than you were at 1. You're a different person at 20 than you were at 10. Let us pray. Although I've met some people who at 20 <laughs> act like they were 10, and so have you. You're a different person at 30 than 20, 40 than 30, 50 than 40, 60 than 50, 70 than 60, 80 than 70. So you're constantly working on these networks because people are what? Platooning in and out of your life. There's only one person on earth that has been with me through all eight passages. I'm in my eighth passage through, uh, uh, through life, and that is my sister, Dr. Emma Fraser Pendleton, the only person living that's been there through all eight passages. So your personal network. The second is your operational network. These are the people that help you to get specific tasks done in life whether it's in your place of business, whether it's in your church if you're on a board or you're working in a church or you're a deacon or a deaconess, whether you're working on special projects. These are people also that platoon in and out of your life. They help you to get a specific task done. You help them get a specific task done, right? They are in your life for what? A reason, right? You've heard the old saying, people are in your life for a reason, a season, or a lifetime. So that's your operational network. That's your second most important network. And the number one most important network is your strategic network. These are the people that are smarter than you. These are the people that will drag you into the 21st century kicking, screaming, and crying. These are the people that are where you want to be. These are the people that will ultimately be your mentors and coaches. These are typically very important people. That's another question I'm asked all the time. Dr. Fraser, how do I meet important people? Well, if you want to meet important people, you have to be where important people are, because they ain't coming to your ass. You have to come to them. <laughs> Which means you have to find out, you have to, wait, you have to have a goal. Do you have a, you have three people, very important people, on a short list of people that ultimately you want to network with and bond with. So to meet them, first, you really need to have a goal. Two of the three that were on my list, Colin Powell and Earl Graves. I don't know how many of you know who Earl Graves was, the founder of Black Enterprise Magazine. So there are three things that have to happen if you want to meet powerful people. You have to be where they are. You have to be early, right? Um, and you have to know something about them. You need to understand who they are and what they're doing and what they're trying to get done. I always wanted to meet Colin Powell. I wanted to meet Colin Powell because he was from New York. I'm from New York. His parents were from the Caribbean. My parents were from the Caribbean. And he was, of course, an a stellar ex example of black excellence. I wanted to meet him. I loved the way he comported himself. Fifteen years ago, he <coughs> was scheduled to do a keynote address at the Sheridan Hotel in downtown Cleveland. It was $100 to get in. I was not a member of the organization that was doing it, but I paid the price for the ticket. It was a noon luncheon speech. I got there at 10.30. Now, the only people that were there was me and the wait staff preparing the room. I waited for about a half hour, and then I peeked into the ballroom, and who was sitting at the speaker's table reading the New York Times, Colin Powell. The small hairs on the back of my neck went up. I walked over to him quietly, introduced myself properly, and asked him, would he like some coffee? He said, yeah. 
I ran back to the kitchen, said, uh, General Powell, he liked to be called General Powell, um, would like some coffee. Can you please get me a silver tray if you serve with white gloves, some white gloves and all the accoutrements, and please give it to me. I'll take it to him. They did that. I took it to him, served him his coffee. And then I sat one table to the right of him because he was right-handed. I said nothing else. I started reading a book. I sat there strategically because I hoped that I would get, get his attention and he would call me over. It took about 22 minutes for that to happen, and he did. He called me over. He asked me my name again. What did I do? And I explained to him very quickly what I did and, and told him that I was most interested in nonprofit and volunteerism. And uh, at that time, I was the vice president of United Way. But prior to being vice president of United Way, which is a double hierarchy, a volunteer organization, is supported by a professional side of the organization. Um, I was also a chairman of the United Negro College Fund Lou Rawls Parade of Stars. I was one of the creators of that many, 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 many years ago. And served on many boards, the Cleveland Ballet, Caramel House, the Cleveland Orchestra. And I went through this litany of stuff that I really enjoyed in my volunteer work. He said, oh, that's interesting. He said, I'm starting a national volunteer initiative. Would you like to be a part of that? I said, I would, I would love to. He said, I'm going to give you my card. I'm going to put my private number on it. And <clears throat> give me a, a week. Call me. And we'll talk. I did. We talked. Bonded. He put me on the National Volunteer Initiative, then provided me a leadership role in that initiative. All I really wanted to do was be around Colin Powell to touch the hem of his cloth, to meet the people right, <clears throat> that he has met and the people that he knows and to lis listen to how he languages and comports himself. We ended up being lifelong friends until he passed. Now, I know you could probably guess this, but don't you think I knew that he was starting a national volunteer initiative? Of course I knew it because I knew about Colin Powell because I wanted to meet him. I studied him. So why do you think when he asked me the open question, I immediately started talking about what? My volunteer work. There was many things I could have talked to him about. He was not interested in many things. He was interested in starting a national volunteer initiative. And I knew if I, could get, if I wanted to get close to him, to serve him in that way. If you want to meet important people, you have to be where important people are, and you have to find a way to add value and to serve them, right? Just get in where you fit in. The rest will take care of itself. Now, I'm running behind on time, so I'm going to speed this up a little bit. Um, that was number five. Number four is that you have no networking system. Let me say that a different way. If you don't have a system, you don't have a business. I don't know what the hell you have, but it ain't a business. Everything is a freaking system. Ray Kroc developed a system to make a freaking hamburger that would taste the same in Brooklyn or in India. It was simply a system. And he became a billionaire developing that system to make a hamburger. You have to have a system for effective networking. Here is my system. This is a system I've been using for 40 years. This is a system I use every single day. These are the things that I do every single day habitually. They have been habitualized. I don't even have to remember to try to do these things. I automatically do these things every day. There are five things I do every single day. Every single day, I write five notes that day to somebody in my network. Now, that 
used to be harder. Now it's a no-brainer. Text messages, emails, depending on who you are. Sometimes I might write a personal note on my fountain pen and mail it to you. But five notes a day, these are minimums to someone in my network. Well, there are five people in my network, a minimum. The second thing I do every single day is I make five phone calls a day to old friends and family. Now, you have to manage that because you could stay on the phone all damn day, <laughs> all right? But stay in touch with old friends and family because you never know. You never know. Five phone calls a day to old friends and family. Then I make the third thing I do is I make five personal contacts a day to new friends. This is when I go through my piles of business cards that I get from people. Right? So if I get business cards here, you'll probably get some communication from me generally within 24 hours. All right? So five personal contacts a day to new friends. The fourth thing I do is five sales calls a day to people I've sold things to, but I'm not selling. Because the last thing I want you to think about me is that the only time you hear from me is when I want to sell you something. No, I'm asking you, how's mom and them? How are the kids doing? Did Bob get out of college? You know, because I, I take notes on the people that I've sold things to, and I keep those cards, and, and I go back to those cards, and, and I bring those things up. when I, So five sales calls a day to people you've sold things to, but you're not selling anything. The final thing I do every single day, and this is the kicker, is I make five introductions every single day of people who need to know each other. Now, I cannot even begin to tell you what that has wrought over 40 years of introducing people to each other. That's my system. That's what I do every single day, 365 days a year, for 40 years. And it's one of the reasons I have one of the large, and I'm bragging, just saying, 1.2 1. 1. million people are in my network. That's the result of it. That wasn't a plan. I didn't say, I think I want 1.2 million people. No. That just was the residual effect of doing those kinds of things. Which means when I need things, I have access. I know people. That's not bragging. I'm just, I know people because I've cultivated those relationships. I've served those relationships. I've provided opportunities to those, uh, those folks in my, in my network. Have a system. Number three, I want to say this and still be loved, you bring nothing to the table. Let me say that differently. God will invite everybody to the table of life to eat. But if the only thing you do when you come to the table of life is eat, and you don't bring anything to the table, you will not be invited back. And it goes down real quiet. Two people are talking about something very important. Someone brings up your name. The other person says, no, they don't bring anything to the table. So you just don't get invited, but you don't even know. One of the keys to success is that you must be a mile, you must be an inch wide and a mile deep in your subject matter expertise. And then you have to be a mile wide and an inch deep in matters of the world so that you can talk about something other than the Real Housewives of Atlanta, the weather, and sports. <laughs> You have to be a 360-degree person. It's really, the, the, the conversation we had last night is a model of what we're talking about, being able to tell stories, relate, connect dots. It, it, was, it was massive fun, engaging and entertaining, and we all learned something, and we all grew from that conversation. So that's what I'm talking about. You must be committed to... This is the key, of course, to sustaining a relationship for uh, till death do you part. Personal growth and development, lifelong learning, and constant never-ending improvement. You never stop learning. Mm -hmm. 
you cannot be average. Let me just get plain with you. Black people cannot be mediocre. Only white people can be mediocre. White people, white people can be mediocre and still be elected to leader of the free world. If Barack Hussein Obama had said or done one one thousandth of what Donald Trump had said or done, he wouldn't have been elected a freaking dog catcher in America, let alone leader of the free world. You cannot be mediocre. My mom taught me many years ago, she said, Georgie boy, <clears throat> if you're black and mediocre in America, you better leave because you're going to be marginalized and you're ultimately going to be destroyed. You have to be amazing. You have to be excellent. So you are either excellent or you are invisible. Let me say that again. You are either excellent or you are invisible in this country at this time. It is not fair and it's not right, but that's what it is. Understand that everything you want in life is going to be on the other side of hard. Let me say that again. Everything that we want in life is going to be on the other side of hard. Let me define hard for you. Hard and life is on the edge. That's where life is. It's on the freaking edge for us. And you must go to the edge and jump off and grow your wings on the way down. That's our life. And that's how it's going to be. The final two. Quickly go over them. Most people think that their IQ is more important than their EQ. You know what EQ is, emotional quotient, or emotional intelligence, or simply said your interpersonal and people skills. The ability to manage your five most important emotions and use the management of those emotions to cultivate, nurture, and to build relationships at work, at home, and in the community. As you grow older and wiser, you're going to find out that your EQ will be far more important than your IQ. I don't care if you have an MBA from Harvard, if you have the personality of a box of rocks, you ain't going nowhere. I don't care how many degrees you have. You cannot work with and through other people. They hate you. And you blame it on them. Your EQ will be critical. The three things that make you up as a human being, your personality, you take an exam for that, and your personality is what it is. Your IQ, and your IQ, by the way, is what it is. It is just your capacity to learn, and you cannot change your IQ. It is what it is. This is what God gave you. And then there's your EQ. You can change that. It's the only one of the three that make you up that you can actually fix. There's a wonderful book, if you haven't read it, Emotional Intelligence 2.0. Emotional Intelligence 2.0. Read that book. Take the EQ exam uh, that you're allowed to take. There's a code in the back of the book. Before you read the book, then take the same exam after you read the book. And after you go through all the exercises. It will change your life. Your EQ is huge. And that's the secret to a lot of people's success. They have an amazingly high EQ. This is the secret to Barack Obama leapfrogging over, over all of those Democrats to ultimately get the nomination and become president. Have you ever been around Barack Hussein Obama? I've been around him. The guy is a beast in terms of how he charms people, talks to people, right? How he comports himself, right? You want to be around him. He's sticky because he's loving, he's caring. Very high EQ. All right, number one. 
The biggest mistake we make when networking, because is, is that most people network to get something. Wrong. You network to give. And as you give, you get. You ain't giving, you ain't getting. If you have nothing, it's because you've given nothing. That you cannot take out of life that which you have not put into life, just as you cannot take out of the bank that which you have not put into the bank. Now, go on down to Comerica and see if you can take something out of that bank you ain't put in. It ain't going to happen. Right? So, you network to give. Generally speaking, if you watch me networking at a large event, and I'm having a conversation with the person. Let's say it's a five or ten minute conversation. The conversation is very simple. They ask me a question. I answer it directly and quickly. And then I flip the entire script. And for the next nine minutes, if it's a ten minute conversation, I'm asking them questions. Now, I have a reason for this. I have an agenda, right? I'm in a contest with them. They don't know that I'm in a contest with them. I believe that the first person that gives wins. So the reason I'm asking them lots of questions is I'm trying to find out who they are, what is their mission, what is their vision, where they're going, what are they trying to do, do. and I'm going through my mental Rolodex of things that I have available that I could give to them as quickly as humanly possible. And when at the end of the conversation I'm able to give them something that's useful to them, I say to myself in the quiet of my own mind, I win. Now, so here's the secret formula. Here's how it goes. Help me help you. Help me. That's how it works. This is biblical. Dr. Fraser didn't make this up. What does the Bible say? It's better to what? Give than receive. But it is impossible to give without receiving, because that's how God has designed the system. You give without conditions. You're not giving to get something. I don't give Nora Jean, my wife of nearly 50 years, flowers because she made me dinner. That's a condition. I don't love Cliff because he loves me. That's a condition. I love him because of who he is and because I can. Not, he doesn't have to love me back equally. So we give unconditionally understanding that it is impossible to give and not get. I may not get it directly back from you. It comes back in the universe. That's how all of life works. That's the biggest mistake we make when networking. My final advice to you is to rid yourself of toxic people, people who drain you of your time, your talent, your treasure, people who drive you freaking crazy. Every successful person I've ever met in life, I've met many, they are magnificently artful in their ability to do that. Now, this is very easy to say, but this is extraordinarily difficult to do. Why? Because most of these toxic people are your family. <laughs> They're your blood. You're connected to them by blood. Very difficult to do. Had I not done this in my life, we wouldn't be having this conversation. How did I get to Cleveland from Brooklyn? Running away from my family. <laughs> I was in an orphanage. At two, my mother became mentally ill. We were put into an orphanage and stayed in an orphanage until five, then put into toxic foster care until I aged out of foster care. When I aged out of foster care, 
I went back to the brownstone that my father maintained that all of us went back to when we aged out, but I was the youngest. So by the time I got there, my older brothers were there. And by the time I got there, they were heroin addicts and heroin dealers, two of them serving time on Rikers Island. I'm in this environment. Now, this is God. This is not any intelligence that Dr. Fraser had. I said to myself, i got to get the hell out of here. So I waited <clears throat> about a couple of years, packed up my bags, got on the Greyhound bus, and came to Cleveland, Ohio, where I had a much older sister who took me in. That one move saved my life. My younger brother, Joseph, who was in foster care with me, he stayed. I left. Joseph stayed. At 43, Joseph was killed in a drug deal that went bad. He became a heroin dealer as a result of the influence of his older brothers. He's dead. Remove toxic people and bloodsuckers from your life. Most of them are your family members. I don't know who I am talking to, but there's somebody in your life that is in your family that you simply need to bless and release. Love them at a distance, but get them out of your freaking life, or you ain't going nowhere. There are endless stories and examples of this thought. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. I'm going to end it right there, because I'm way over time. But I'm loving this, and I'm loving that you are engaged and, and paying attention. If you have some questions, I'll be more than happy to answer those questions. Let me just do um, a little one minute of selfless promotion. I have two books with me. Click 10 Truths for Building Extraordinary Relationships. This is Networking 2.0. This book poses a theory that I created that you click with people when three things are in perfect alignment. You don't click with everybody you network with. But when these three things are in perfect alignment, chemistry, fit, and timing, chemistry, fit, and timing, that's when you click. That's when things click. Chemistry, fit, and timing. We could have good fit, good chemistry, bad timing, we won't click. We could have good timing, good fit, bad chemistry, we won't click. When those three things are in perfect alignment, that's when we click. Here's the formula. Write this algebraic formula down. C square, that's what? Chemistry. When you square something, what do you do? You increase the power of that factor. Times T. That's timing, times the square root of f. When you square root something, that reduces the power of the factor. Equals w to the third power. Equals w to the third power. Win, win, win. You win, I win, and the people that we both serve win. C square, right? Now, the reason you use times in an equation is because it says that all factors must be present in order to get the final result. So that's what CLICK is about. It's networking 2.0. What are the extraordinary things that you can do to build extraordinary relationships? And then this is a book my sister and I call Who Would Have Thunk It? The First Adventure of the Fraser Foster Kid. It's a wonderful little Christmas gift for your children or grandchildren. And it's a book that teaches young kids. This is my sister, Emma. This is me, Georgie Boy. That's what I was called. And this is my younger brother, Joseph, who was killed in a drug deal that went bad, right? The three of us teaching other kids in the neighborhood that it takes teamwork to make the dream work, right? So it's a wonderful little book. So there's a little package that we have. This Click sells for 30 and this sells for 20 If you get them both, it's 45 bucks. Okay, so that's the shameless self-promotion. And then you'll see a little flyer on your table. It says 2020. That was to be the live conference in 2020, but COVID. So we had to turn it into a virtual. So what I want you to do is to cross off 2020. 
and put in 2022. That's when the next or the first live conference in three years, Power Networking Conference, will be in Houston, 2022, then cross off July 8th through the 11th and put in August 3rd through 6th. August 3rd through 6th. It will be in Houston, Texas. Everything else is the same. So I want to make you a special offer. In adult registration, you can go on the back there. Standard adult registration is $1,500. And a student registration is $800. We want you to bring a student because we need our young people, when we conference, sitting at the feet of masters. But they need to be coached and mentored and managed by you. We don't want 300 kids running around our conference unorganized and unmanaged. This would be a bad thing. All right? So I want, to, I want to give you a package of an adult registration and a student registration. Instead of paying $2,300, $1,508, you're going to pay $599. $599. That's $1,700 off for you and an adult. Houston is just a drive for you. So you have no excuse regarding transportation. How long is it? About three hours? Four hours? Four hours, right. Like from Cleveland to Cincinnati. So that's the offer. The offer is, is good for as long as I am here. When I leave, the offer's over. Okay? Now, it's also available to those who we're streaming this to. And if you want to get this um, and you're, you're watching it on Facebook Live, you have to email me. You can't go to our website, powernetworkingconference.com. You have to get this offer live from me. And you just email me at gfraser at frasernet.com. gfraser at frasernet.com. Put in the subject line, I'm in. Put in the body of the email your full name and your cell number, your full name and your cell number, and I will call you personally and we will handle our business over the phone. For those of you online, for those of you who are here, just fill out the back part if you're interested in getting this special offer and give it to me before I leave, okay? So that's all I have. I'm way over time. Thank you for your generosity. and. God bless you and keep you in God's word. Thank you. Wow. Hey, this is not over, right? This is not over because immediately um, there's, there's a book signing in one of the conference rooms. And I would tell you, don't be one of those seven worst mistakes. Right? <laughs> So, so you've made a connection now. You've made a connection now. Let's stay connected. Now, for those of you who are live, I want to thank you for your participation. We're going to go ahead and end this now, but uh, expect an edited version of this program being uploaded on our YouTube channel. Since you're on YouTube, go ahead and uh, subscribe, like us, make comments, share it. Don't let this be the end, but I want to thank you for spending the time and watching us live uh, on YouTube. So thank you very much. Now, for us that are in the house, right? Uh, so we're going to be here for a while. I would say continue to network. Meet somebody new that is here with you. But like I said before, uh, Dr. Frazier is going to be in the conference room to your, to your right. And if